Death is the beginning, the birth of births, a rebirth, a second chance to fix all mistakes. Death is the beginning. Mark Lamp. There is magic all around us. It permeates our world and therefore our lives. Part of that magic exists tied deeply within the rebirth of the earth herself. Brought about each spring as flowers come forth from the ground, life returning once again. This morning, I'd like you to join me on a journey throughout the ages, focusing on the mythos of resurrection. At its core, resurrection is about rebirth. Keep this in mind as we travel throughout the centuries, exploring a multitude of pantheons whose story tie both into spring and at times the strength of the human spirit. For many citizens of societies long past gained hope from the stories of the deities they followed. For the sake of time, the main focus of this sermon, for the most part, will be on the deities from pantheons past who died and were resurrected, leaving a number of gods and goddesses who technically died when they were kidnapped and spirited away to the underworld, as well as those who disappeared and reappeared later. As we explore different pantheons, one can quickly see that a multitude of these myths connect to the natural agricultural society or cycle of ancient societies. As was pointed out by author James Frazier of The Golden Bow, who noted that such a motif is, was not at all unsurprising. I personally found it most fascinating that while perusing ancient pantheons, powerful similarities existed amongst them all. As it is Easter Sunday, we shall begin with a resurrection story many are familiar with, that of Jesus of Nazareth. In Christianity, the death and resurrection of Jesus is a foundation of the faith. His rebirth is commemorated at Easter. Jesus is said to have spread the gospel, healed the sick, and spoke up against the powers of the time. I always think of him as a rebel flipping over tables when he perceived corruption. Those in power seemed to almost fear him, insisting that he disobeyed Mosaic law. After two trials, Jesus was found guilty of claiming to be the king of Jews and sentenced to death. Three days after his sentence was carried out, he is known to have risen from the dead, first appearing to Mary Magdalene. His followers believed that he was the Messiah and his word led to the kingdom of heaven. The Christian faith attests that followers will be, in a sense, reborn in this kingdom, and that as the son of God, he is the human representation of God on earth. The experiences of his trials and death shine a light on the ultimate ability human beings are capable of, offering hope as well as the strength possible within the human spirit. Jesus' story ties into resurrection and therefore rebirth. While most children that I grew up with spoke of this story on Easter Sunday, I was raised by a mother who encouraged me to explore many different ideas. So it is not at all surprising that when I think of resurrection, my first thought is always the legendary phoenix. The mythos most of us are familiar with is deeply connected with the sun and the element of fire. The story of this amazing creature is found throughout multiple ancient civilizations. One such example is the Feng Wang, a mythological creature in China, which is quite similar to the Western version of the story of the Phoenix that most of us are familiar with. Archaeological discoveries offer a peek into an ancient form of totism with detailed use of both dragons and Feng Wang. The earliest design with both that dragon and, phoenix and the phoenix dates back thousands of years. The phoenix is also seen in both the Grecian and Egyptian mythology, mythological belief systems, each with slight variations that differ between cultural beliefs. The general gist that seems to connect all of the different stories is that the phoenix dies, bursts into flames, or in some case decomposes and is then reborn. The legend of the phoenix is the epitome of rebirth. And although it is not central to spring herself, the story speaks volumes about the strength of the human spirit. 
most aptly put by author Janet Fitch when she wrote, the phoenix must burn to emerge. Now we will begin to traverse the history of different cultures. We'll begin with Egypt. In the second century AD, the author Plutarch studied Egyptian culture and religious beliefs. He wrote the most complete account of the resurrection and mythos behind the Egyptian god Osiris. Osiris is an important deity in the ancient Egyptian pantheon and was known by many names, including, though not limited to, Winifer, the beautiful one. Though he is most commonly known as the god of the underworld, his brother Seth, the god of disorder, was jealous of him, and so he hatched a plan to murder him. The god of discord had a coffin made, then presented the beautifully crafted piece as a prize at a party. He said, whoever so fit in the sarcophagus could have it. The casket was, of course, designed to Osiris's specifications, and when he laid in it, his brother slammed the lid, sealed it with lead, and then sent it down the Nile. Upon hearing what happened, Osiris's wife Isis began to search for him, fearing that if he was not properly buried, he would not travel to the afterlife. The sarcophagus traveled down the Nile and was caught in the trunk of a tree in Byblos. It is interesting to note that in his literary piece, The Roots of Monasticism, author Winthrop Boswell wrote that the place where Osiris's coffin floated must be Nod of Bible, where Cain built his first city after becoming an exile and a wanderer, citing it as the ancient name for Byblos. But I digress. Let's get back to the story at hand. The king of Byblos had the tree cut down to use as a pillar for his palace. Isis found his body and spirited it away, hiding him. She had her sister Nephthys, who was Seth's wife, guard Osiris's body so that she could go search for herbs to use in conjunction with magic to bring him back from the dead. Seth talked his wife into disclosing the location of Osiris's body and then proceeded to cut him into 14 pieces, spreading the parts of his body all over Egypt. Isis, with Nephthys' help, found all but one of the pieces and put his body back together, then buried him. This process allowed Osiris to travel to the abode of the dead, ultimately placing him in the position of judge in the underworld. Osiris's death and rebirth link him to the agricultural cycle of, ancient, of the ancient Egyptian world, correlating even the flooding of the Nile herself to his resurrection. This story provided followers with an example of what is possible. Or as author of the literary piece, Awakening Osiris, Normandy Ellis wrote, my body is but wax and wick for flame. When the candle burns out, the light shines elsewhere. The myth behind Osiris's death follows similar patterns to other myths throughout the ages. Archeological finds in Syria support this. Speaking of a battle between gods and their pantheon, shedding light on the past, much like Plutarch's literary works did for ancient Egypt. In the early 1900s, archaeologists located a collection of ancient cuneiform texts known as the Ugaritic text, including one literary work called the Baal Cycle. This text details a conflict between the gods Baal and Mat. After Baal, the god of life and fertility, defeated Yam, the god of the sea, he traveled to the underworld and challenged Mot, the god of death and sterility. In this mythos, the two deities become locked in an eternal mortal battle that was seen to have been tied to the agricultural season. Droughts were explained by Mot's winning the annual encounter. Similarly, in the ancient city of Sumner in Mesopotamia crops up a resurrection myth concerning the goddess Inanna. In the story, the goddess Inanna, also known as Ishtar, travels to the underworld with the intent to battle for control of the realm. Her sister, the goddess Eresh Kigal, reigned in the Sumerian land of the dead. While in the underworld, Inanna is weakened and ultimately put on trial by seven judges of the netherworld for excessive pride. She was found guilty and her sentence was death or entrapment in the underworld. 
Nen Shibur, her second in command, begged the gods for help resurrecting her. All but one god, A, the god of wisdom, agreed, allowing the goddess a reprieve. So Inanna was raised from the underworld. However, the guardians of the realm insisted on a replacement to remain in her stead. So when the goddess is raised from the dead, the guardians of the underworld drag her husband, Dumuzi, down to stay in her place. Later, Dumuzi's sister trades places with him in the underworld for part of the year, tying an additional pantheon's mythos directly to a civilization's agricultural season. The Grecian equivalent of the ancient Mesopotamian god Dumuzi is fairly well known as the god Adonis. His story tells of how the queen of Kypros bragged to her that her daughter Mira was more beautiful than the goddess Aphrodite herself. The goddess of love was furious about the claim and was quite vengeful in her retaliation. She cursed the young Mira to fall in love with her father and consummate their union. When Mira's father realized what happened, he drew his sword and sought to kill his daughter. The young girl pleaded with the gods for help, so they turned her into a mere tree. Some stories claim this is to save her, and other stories say it is to punish her. Adonis was born by bursting out of the tree. Eventually, both the goddesses Persephone, goddess of the underworld, and Aphrodite, goddess of love, both fell in love with Adonis. When Adonis was skewed by a wild boar on a hunting trip, Aphrodite was heartbroken and begged her father Zeus to resurrect him. Zeus did so and permitted Adonis to spend half of the year with Aphrodite and the other half of the year with Persephone and the underworld. It is said that as he bled out in Aphrodite's arm, his blood transformed into a flower, red anemone, sometimes called the windflower, tying Adonis with the agricultural seasons through his method of birth, his annual reemergence from the realm of the dead, and his blood magically creating windflowers. Rumi wrote, for those who love with heart and soul, there is no such thing as separation. A quote that speaks volumes for both Adonis as well as his civilian counterpart, Addis. The story of Addis is a parallel, parallel mythos attached to a cult that sprang up in Rome. The goddess Sybil's companions is said to be born of the goddess Nana, the daughter of the Sangangrius River. The story goes that, Addis, that when Addis's mother Nana ate the fruit of an almond tree, he was born of the goddess nine months later. Nana exposed the babe to the elements, but he was saved by shepherds who raised him as their own. He fell deeply in love with the princess, unaware that the goddess Sybil was enamored by him. On the day of Addis's wedding, the goddess Sybil showed up in an effort to stop the wedding, driving Addis mad. He killed himself under a pine tree and wherever his blood dropped, violets grew. Zeus also assisted Sybil in this particular story in resurrecting Addis from the dead. Yet another tale connecting the agricultural season to the resurrection or rebirth of the mythological figure. History in the ancient world also offers examples of entire belief systems based upon resurrection. One such cult stands out, the ancient Mithraic mysteries belief system, centering around the Iranian god Mithra. This spiritual and religious cult's practices of veneration sprang up, as I said, in Roman times. The deity in the belief system, the god Mithros, was born from a rock under the cover of a sacred fig tree. He came into the world clutching a sacred dagger and a torch. He is known as the god of contracts, with his first negotiation being with the sun itself. Rebirth was the central hope of the Mithraic belief system. Although the practices within the mysteries are shrouded, they seem to have been a cult in which initiates pass the knowledge from one to another, retaining secrecy concerning internal worship. Because of such practices, not much is known about the internal workings of the cult. However, experts are sure that the entire belief system was about resurrection. So much so that devotees themselves could gain resurrection. As we travel eastward from Iran to India, 
we find ourselves once again enmeshed in a resurrection narrative. In the Hindu epic Mahabharata, the god Krishna took the form of a human in an effort to better understand our ways. While at a festival, an argument breaks out and Krishna goes into the woods to meditate. And while there, a hunter mistakes him for a deer and wounds him fatally. His body is burned on a funeral pyre, but as he is a deity, he ascends to heaven. Another interesting story about rebirth or resurrection from the same region is that of the god Ganesh. It is important to note that there are admittedly many different stories concerning Ganesh in the Hindu pantheon. One such myth says that the goddess Pavarti created Ganesh specifically to guard her chamber. When Ganesh refused to let Shiva enter, he cut off his head. This annoyed Pavarti, and in an effort to make up for the beheading, Shiva brought Ganesh back to life. As he beheaded him, a new head was given, one that is now well known worldwide, the head of an elephant. Not all stories about rebirth and resurrection contain gods or goddesses as central figures. As we have seen thus far, prophets and mythological creatures also tie into the theme of rebirth. So now we move forward in line with one of our Unitarian Universalist sources. The direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces that create and uphold life. Finnish mythology tells of a shamanistic figure, Lemin Kinnian, who dies in an attempt to capture one of the black swans on the river in the underworld. In mourning, his mother searches for his body. Heartbroken, when she finds him splintered into pieces, she decides to sew him back together in the hopes that he'll come back to life. When it does not work, she has a bee bring her some of the honey of the gods and uses it to resurrect her son. Although we have heard many terrible stories that deities did to one another, we have also found hope in the stories of past ages. Hope that love itself could con help conquer any devastating act. Hope that there is within each of us an ability to rise from the ashes. And so I end this sermon with one more story. One where much like the phoenix we began with heralds a death that leads to rebirth. Norse mythology tells of an ultimate battle that ends with the entire world being destroyed then reborn. Ragnarok occurs when the gods battle and the world is plunged into a three year long winter, a war in which the sun and moon are destroyed. A new earth is born of the sea and the dead sun gives birth to a new daughter who takes her fallen mother's place in the sky. Little survives Ragnarok, but what does make it through the harrowing experience births new life on earth. Resurrection in and of itself is rebirth. It is undoubtedly obvious by now that the central theme exists throughout time, no matter the pantheon. A theme that oftentimes ties the rebirth of the earth herself snugly into different mythologies. Both of civilizations long dead and belief systems still actively practiced. Although experts agree that it is a common theme in both a literal and a figurative manner, it in no way discounts what one can walk away with when exploring different cultural mythos. Perhaps when our ancestors suffered, they took heart when thinking about what the gods, the prophets, and the shamans all went through deeply connecting to harrowing journeys that shone a light on the possibilities we are all capable of. For we all have those times in our lives where much like the phoenix, we burst into flames, where seemingly nothing but ashes remain behind. So perhaps today's subject is less about resurrection and more about rebirth. So many human beings throughout history have believed in a sort of a magic behind rebirth itself taking solace throughout Pantheon's past and the stories of each deity's ability to spring back from the ashes. As previously stated, at its core, resurrection is about rebirth. 
And each time many of the citizens of past and present civilizations shared such stories, hope and strength were found. We all have exactly what we need for a spiritual rebirth. For the magic I spoke of at the beginning of this sermon exists and is all around us, permeating our lives, our world, and our very being. For no matter the belief system nor the burial rites utilized within, hope is found in resurrection. Hope is tied to rebirth. Perhaps Seneca said it best when he wrote, the day which we fear as our last is but the birthday of eternity. Now go forth and seek rebirth and growth in all ventures, my mosaic and brothers and sisters. Perhaps you'll find some mischievous fun along the way. Amen and blessed be.